Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our guest Adam Grimes from Waverly Advisors. Before we get started, just a quick disclaimer that Capital Discussions is not a broker-dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. You don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And again, this is for educational purposes only. So with that out of the way, Adam, I will turn the ball back over to you so you can share your screen. And uh, welcome back to the round table. Um, it's uh, always great to have you here. Thank you, great to be with you today. Uh, let me get my screen share up. And just tell me, does, does that look okay from your end? Are we good? Uh, I don't see it yet. Hmm, maybe I need to do something here. I'm in a meeting. Oh. Let yeah. me... Always these awkward moments getting <laughs> started. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, I, perhaps I'm not well, it, sharing my screen. Yeah, you're not sharing it. If you're on Windows, try Control Alt D like Got that. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, how's that's that? it. Perfect. Fantastic. And then okay. uh, just uh, go ahead and uh, just if people haven't uh, seen your other recording, Adam. Uh, Really great with technical analysis, has a fantastic advisory service at Waverly, and uh, very, very knowledgeable on technical analysis in the markets, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the presentation. So uh, take it away, Adam. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Uh, we'll do a little bit of Q&A at the end. I do have a, a presentation here that I've done in different contexts. And this originally is a very big presentation. Last time I gave it, uh, four questions of trading. I got somewhere through the second question heading into the beginning of the second hour of the presentation. So obviously I've kind of chopped this down today, but let me tell you what I want to do here in the next hour. Biggest thing is I want to challenge you to think differently and to think critically. And that is, you know, the, in this business after doing this for 20 plus years, uh, thinking critically about trading ideas and trading patterns is something that doesn't happen enough. It seems like it seems like that should be at the top of everyone's to-do list, but it really isn't. So I want to encourage you to see some things from a little bit of a different perspective. And today I've really tried to pull out a lot of the theory, a lot of the mathematical background. You won't see that in this presentation. Um, I'll show you places where you can go to find some more of the background stuff that I've talked about. But I really want to talk more about practical things and conceptual things. So the four questions of trading, you know, I started saying I'm a big believer in simplifying things even at the very advanced level. Uh, if we can look and say what are the fundamental things, what are the basics that I need to execute the skill well? And with trading, I really think it comes down to four questions. What am I going to trade? When am I going to get in? When am I going to get out? and how much am I going to trade when I trade? There's a lot of variations of those things, but that's really, those four questions, everything is encapsulated there. What, when, how much, and when do you get out? Your answers to those questions, however, will say a lot on, about who you are as a trader. And I guess by way of introduction, <laughs> that's a pretty good lead in. Uh, who am I? If you have not seen me or heard me talk before, uh, I do a lot of social media, uh, a lot of writing, and actually various media outlets. Uh, my day job is I'm the CIO of Waverly Advisors, which, as Tom said, and thank you for your kind words, is a research and advisory firm. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation, though this is not a sales presentation. I've been doing this for over two decades. I've been all over the map with regard to time frame and asset classes. I've traded everything from stocks, futures, currencies, options, options on all of those, uh, probably less options on currencies than anything else. And I've done everything from short-term scalping, literally holding trades for seconds, to building long-term portfolios. Um, I've done systematic. My, I, I guess I would say somebody says, who are you as a trader? 
the core of what I do is a blend of quantitative and discretionary work, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. But I also have you know, a few more layers. I was a musician for a while. I was a classical musician, a uh, brief detour into culinary school, and I did an apprenticeship with a French chef who was a disciple of Paul Bocuse. So, you know, I, I cook a lot and do, do a lot of different things. And also talk, I'm not going to talk too much in this presentation today, but I will tell you I think one of the most important things that you probably should be doing that you probably are not doing is having some practice of meditation. And I have a free resource that I'll give you that can get you started on that. If it's something you've always kind of looked at, don't really know how to do, uh, I can at least get you started. So that's coming at the end of the presentation. So back to my approach markets. As I said, a blended quantitative discretionary approach. I focus on trades that last, I would say, a few days to a few weeks. And the reason for that is, I guess there are really two reasons. First of all, it's a lifestyle decision. I made the decision that sitting in front of a screen banging out 250 scalp trades a day. It really was not a good use of my time here on this planet. And so, you know, you trade in the two-day to two-week time frame. It gets you out of that noise a little bit, gets you out of that obsessive contact with every tick of the market. And also probably the bigger reason is this is where I found the best statistical and quantitative edge. And when I speak with other people who've done a lot of quantitative work, this comes up a lot. Uh, you know, I hear lots of people who run pretty big funds who say, yeah, we literally, they'll say two days to two weeks. And uh, I say, well, why, why do that? Well, it's just what the testing shows. I do think that, and one thing that separates me from a lot of people, I think a good understanding of probability and statistics is really important. However, the behavioral side, discipline, focus, all these things you hear about are also important. Again, we're going to circle around to this at the end. Probably the thing that distinguishes me at least as a social media guy, is I'm really skeptical of most of the stuff out there. And I think most of what is sold to the public just simply does not work as advertised. And, you know, that's, that's frustrating, but that's the way it is. So here's kind of the outline of this presentation. We're going to go over some of this very quickly. I'm not really going to talk about asset classes and time frames uh, for more than 45 seconds because you've already made those decisions. We're going to spend a little bit of time. This is a very, very important question, thinking about how markets usually move. I'm going to point you, we're going to do a thumbnail sketch. I'm going to hit one very important point, and then I'll point you toward some other resources that I've done. Uh, look at a few effective patterns. Again, I'll show you other resources outside of this presentation. You see that I'm not spoon feeding you here. What I'm doing is giving you a framework and giving you the tools to go investigate and dig deeper. It's like saying, you know, X marks the spot, here's your shovel. Uh, we will spend some time talking about money management, position sizing, luck and randomness, and then how to close this behavior gap between knowing what to do and actually doing the right thing, which is something I think a lot of people struggle with. So here's the 45 seconds on asset class. Um, you can read this, I'll trust your literacy to read this, but I guess the thing that I would encourage you and the thing that I have faced at several points in my trading career is thinking about when it's time to look at something else. I actually have a slide on that. Um, there are good and bad reasons for this, and you know, in some cases, it's just a desire to do something else. I guess what I will say is just be prepared. So if you trade options, I would gently encourage you maybe to consider sometimes trading underlying. And you know, I'd also encourage people who just trade, just trade the underline, maybe you should think about using options in some ways. What is interesting is when you go to these different trading arenas, trading asset classes, you'll find that a lot of your knowledge will transfer, but some won't. And in some cases, some things that will serve you very well in certain time frames, context asset classes, will be a serious danger and liability in another. And while that might be frustrating at first, also consider that a growing edge. Consider that if something is difficult, then it's probably something where if you work and develop the skill, you can enrich, round, you know, use whatever word you want, round yourself out as a trader. And I do think we're always trying to find that balance between building competence and skill with one asset 
but also seeing things with new eyes. Just be careful about jumping around too much. And, you know, it, it, as an aside, like I knew lots of people, and I guess you still see this, who trying to day trade stock index futures, which I think is one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, you certainly can do it. Uh, I did it for a number of years, but it's very, very difficult. And you'll see things like people are saying the S&P isn't working, so then I'm going to trade the Dow, I'm going to trade the YM or the NQ or something. And I don't think there's any, you know, you're basically trading the same market. Maybe there's differences in risk, which you should consider. But just make sure that you're not just kind of randomly flailing around and trying something different. So that's all on that. Um, and I definitely want to do question and answer, but I apologize because doing the presentation like this, I cannot see the questions as we go along. So if you want to just type those in the box, uh, I'll be sure at the end of the presentation to leave some time to, to, to do some Q&A. And uh, Tom, if you see something important come in and you just want to jump in and interrupt me, uh, you know, cer certainly these things work better if there's a little bit of dynamic give and take. So don't feel you have to wait until the end. So the next question, when to get into trade? Everybody thinks about this. This is books, uh, webinars, seminars, classes. Everything centers around trading patterns, when to get into a trade. I do think that this is not the most important trading question and the focus on this. You know, it's sexy and exciting. I'm going to show you a pattern that means the market is going to do this. And when you learn this super secret pattern, you'll be able to find winning trade. Of course, that's a great sales line. But even if you did have a pattern like that, you got to do a lot of things to make the trade work. And another problem with all this pattern stuff is that a lot of things that people think work don't actually work talk about that. Uh, what does it mean for something to work? And this is, if you don't understand this, if you don't understand what I'm saying here, then I think you'll have a difficult time understanding my perspective on markets. So for me to say something works, we have to see a tilt in the probabilities of one thing happening over another thing happening. That's all we're saying. If you assume that, and I do think it's correct, that in most cases, markets have a random walk expectation, meaning we don't know what's going to happen outside of maybe a certain volatility envelope, um, you know, with, with things happening in the tails also. And this is how options are priced, and those assumptions are pretty darn good most of the time. And we do need to understand that this is only a range of probabilities. There's absolutely no certainty. But what we can do in some cases is to find a tilt and to say that I'm just going to it's not 50%, but let's say that from this point, a stock has a 50% chance of going up or going down. And if I can say, well, here's a pattern that shows there's a 54% chance of one thing happening over another, that is a potential edge. That's the type of result that we want from a pattern. Um, it's relatively easy. If we're talking about price patterns and, you know, I show you many past examples and we start to look at the probabilities, it's easy to understand that in patterns. But just be aware, everything you do in markets is under the umbrella of probabilities. So are you thinking about, when you think about Brexit, when you think about macro, when you think about political stuff, when you think about fundamentals, when you think about all of this stuff, are you thinking about it in terms of probabilities? In other words, I think it would be folly for somebody to say, just for instance, uh, I'm apolitical, but let's descend into the political realm. Uh, if Donald Trump is elected, this is going to happen. With any degree of certainty, maybe the best we could say is if this event happens, then there's a slightly higher probability of this happening. But the problem is that when people talk about macro and political stuff, they speak with such passion and with such certainty, and that's, that's, that's very, very false. So be careful of that, and just make sure everything you do, you think about in terms of probabilities. And we do need to really dig into the numbers to figure out how this works. Now, at this point, I don't have a lot of numbers in this presentation. I would encourage you, and Tom can show you where to find it if you don't already know. Uh, I did a previous presentation. You'll see a little, bit, a very little bit of overlap here. But in that previous presentation I did for capital discussions, we spent a lot of times going, a lot of time going into the numbers, and I talked a lot about my methodology, my research methodology. We looked at specific patterns, I tables and tables of tendencies and things. So that's there. 
And you also can find that on my blog, my podcast. I have a free trading course. I'll, we're not going to go into that today, but if you are interested, and you probably should be, uh, you should dig a little bit deeper into that, and we'll give you some resources for that. So here's what I think about markets. They're mostly but not always efficient. And I mean efficient in the academic sense. Everything is fairly priced. If markets are efficient, price movements are random. This is usually true. There are, however, these points of inefficiencies. You can use that word if you want. I think of them as potential possible opportunities for profit. One thing that's very interesting is these inefficiencies tend to come in spurts. So we'll look at a market, whether it's the stock market as a whole, an individual stock uh, futures market like cocoa or something, and you'll see it'll go through a long period of time where we don't really have any statistical tilts. And then we'll start to see things set up, and this may be driven partially by the evolution of volatility, but we'll see these inefficiencies come in groups where we have opportunities for trades. I do think that behavioral factors are very, very important for shaping price action and price direction. And I think there's also something to the idea that market efficiency may be an evolving process. Andrew Lowe has written on this. Uh, Google the adaptive markets hypothesis. It's his answer to the efficient market hypothesis, which in his idea is that a market can be modeled as an ecosystem with different groups of traders, prey animals, predators, uh, competing and evolving and developing new tools. It explains pretty well a lot of what we see in markets, so check that out. Uh, I do think that one of the things, and options traders generally are already a few steps along this path, um, but this is one thing that separates more quantitative traders from everybody else, is that we understand that randomness is the enemy. Randomness hides the truth of our results, hides the truth of patterns, and you know you have to think about it. A lot of statistical tools, many of many of the statistical tools that are out there, really exist to help us separate what is random from what might not be random, and that's the whole point of doing pattern analysis. That's the whole point of doing research. One thing that I think is extremely important is, and we can speculate why this might be so, but humans have really bad intuition about randomness. You know, we're very good at doing a lot of things. We're very good at finding patterns. We're very good at uh, kind of inductive reasoning. We're good at so many cognitive tasks. But understanding what might be random and what might not be random is something that we fall flat when we try to do this. And this is not you. This is not something that you are bad at. This is something we are all very bad at. People speculate, you know, maybe there was no, if you think about evolutionary selection, maybe there was no evolutionary edge to being able to understand randomness where the things that we are good at, finding patterns, facial recognition, People in the distant past who could remember other people's faces had a higher chance of survival. Not the, the, this idea of sitting down in front of a spreadsheet of numbers or a chart of numbers and understanding that something might not be random. There's not a lot of precedent for human survival. There certainly is in the marketplace, but it's not something that we have naturally developed and built. Uh, so just be aware your intuition is flawed in this area. Uh, it's probably not something we can really do a lot to fix, so we have to be careful about when we see something. I sat beside a trader for a while who just could not understand this, and you see something happening, uh, most likely random in the order book, and be sure that, you know, this can't be random. There's somebody who's doing something, but it's, it's not an intuition you can trust, so just be aware of that. Why did I just spend too many minutes talking about this slide? Because if something is random, we can't make money with it. We may make money with it once, but not over a large set of trades. So we have to have an edge. We have to have a statistical edge over randomness. And uh, one of the topics I thought about presenting here, and we may do in the future, is just on this idea, how we tease out randomness and luck and all of the different ways, even if we think we've done that, that it can come back to kick us. Uh, we also need to consider risk and volatility. You know, it's not enough to say, we're going to talk about a pattern here in a minute, what happens to stocks after they make significant highs. And I'm, uh, I won't tease you with that. I'll tell you the bottom line is they go down a little bit on average. However, that idea of going down on average 
hides a lot of other possibilities. They might explode to the upside sometime. They might get, you know, they, they might absolutely collapse. They might just go sideways. And we need to think about that variability. We also need to think particularly for options traders about the evolution of volatility and how volatility changes and some, some of the patterns that we find and prices can be predictive of volatility. And we can also circle that back the other way. And all of this, of course, is hidden under a good degree of noise and randomness. So in my work, I have found, and I disclosed pretty much every tool that I use, and most of the mathematical tools that I use are very, very simple. There will be times that we'll use some more, uh, you know, obtuse or arcane, if you will, statistical analyses, but not really. In most cases, uh, doing an average, looking at the median, understanding some measure of variation, is enough to understand a lot of this stuff. So uh, if you want to start thinking and doing a little bit more of your digging, uh, here's some advice that I found to be very, very useful. And this is uh, with my advice to myself after many years of trying to figure this out. Just be very suspicious of all published stats. You know, you have people who are generating an almost daily flow on social media of market stats. When this happens, this has happened in the past. And just be very careful of that because it's, if I had the task of generating an interesting market stat every day, I can tell you 18 days out of 20 what I would, I don't know why I didn't say 9 out of 10, <laughs> 9 out of 10 times what I would come up with would be meaningless because there just are not that many strong statistical edges. So be very careful of that, very suspicious. I also think it's important to do some work by hand. I'm a big believer in this. And this may be as simple as printing out some charts, marking up a lot of charts. Uh, I think there's value in doing some numerical work by hand. You know, go through and figure something out. And let's say you're looking at what happens. For instance, after stocks make 52-week highs, what happens one month after? Well, we can do that in Excel pretty easily. Uh, we can do it in other statistical packages even easier. But there might be some value in you going back to the last 10 years of market data, finding out when that happens, and then maybe writing down the number, you know, what's the basis point return, what's the return of basis points a uh, month after, something like that. Just start tabulating and keeping track of things like that. There's a lot happening here cognitively that I'm not sure I fully understand, but I can tell you in my experience that there's a lot of value in having close contact with the data like this. So consider that, but also, do proper statistical analysis. Look at a large number of events. Look at a lot of data. Use the appropriate tools. Be careful of data snooping bias. Be very careful of the idea. You know, like sometimes uh, somebody recently sent me an email and said, I've tested thousands of variations of trading patterns. And what he's really done <coughs> is looking at, say, the last five days of price data and testing every permutation of uh, if high, low, relating to previous bars, not, you know, not every, but many, close open. This is kind of a shotgun test, and this is, if you find something, you're certainly susceptible to data mining bias here. But I think my approach is to understand why something should work, to have an idea about behaviorally what might be happening, and it might not always be obvious. You, know, you might see a pattern and you might say, why should this work? And the reasons that we come up with might even be wrong, but I think it has to have some root in market dynamics and market behavior and understand why something should work rather than just shotgun testing patterns. Also, if something's too good to be true, you made a mistake. It's a lesson that I have learned many times. And you know, even, even now I find a pattern sometimes that I get very, very excited about. And, uh, it's the best thing I've ever seen. Well, it's the best thing I've ever seen. Probably made a mistake somewhere. So, you know, as I said, if you want to understand more of how I'm looking and the types of patterns that I'm looking at, there are other places you can go. What I want to do now is in thinking about trade entry and market behavior to kind of give you what I call the two forces model, which is looking at the interaction of mean reversion momentum. This is a practical this is kind of the uh, you know, pointy end, the tip of the spear of all of this statistical research boiled down to what shapes price movements. 
And you can think of it as the war between mean reversion and momentum. Mean reversion, of course, is the tendency for a large move to snap back. Momentum is the tendency for a large move to continue in the same direction. And over – here's where I think some research goes wrong. You know, a lot of academic research will tell you markets are random. Market action is random. Well, over a large sample of trades, these two forces will balance each other out. You will see mean aversion momentum pretty much in balance and market expectations pretty much random. What we are able to do, though, is to identify some conditions which show when one force is likely to be in effect in the, going forward in the future. And when we can do that, what we have done is found a trading edge. That's kind of the bottom line. That's a quantitative way to address the whole problem of directional trading. Can I find a pattern that will show you when, over a certain time frame, mean reversion or momentum is more likely to be in effect? To take it down another level, I could say it a different way. Can I find a pattern that will show me if the market makes a big move, should I be going with that move? or going against that move. Market goes up, is it likely to go up more? Or market goes up, should I look to short it or sell it, thinking that it will snap back? And the answer is yes, we can find this pattern. Uh, here are some patterns that do work for mean reversion. And if you do nothing more than find large single bars, you can do this. You know, a good heuristic is to just look at a chart. Your eye will automatically, a lot of people hate charts. I'm not, not really sure why. I think there's some uh, you know, intellectual arrogance there maybe. Uh, charts are certainly misused, but charts are very useful also. And one of the great things that charts can do, you know, I, I do all kinds of volatility analysis and looking at volatility adjusted moves, but an experienced chart reader can do the same thing at a glance. You can look at a chart and the big moves on that chart will jump out. And those big moves, generally speaking, on all asset classes do have a small tendency to snap back. Multiple closes in the same direction, which I have here is fading in day runs. This would be, uh, you know, you might imagine this has a tie in with multiple time frames. So if let, let's say we're looking at the S&P 500, and I tell you, okay, if you have a big spike day up, it's likely to reverse back down over a certain time frame. And I might also tell you the same thing on the weekly chart. If you have a big week up, there's an edge for it to reverse a little bit on the weekly time frame. Well, another way to see that might be to look for five big daily moves up, which would be kind of packed inside a weekly bar. So it's not exactly the same thing, but there's a little bit of overlap there. Uh, fading breakouts of in-day highs or lows. Now, if you're thinking critically here, there's probably a warning light going off in your head because you're saying, well, I don't know about that because there are a lot of stock trading systems, CanSlim, for instance, that say you should be buying stocks at 52-week highs. Um, the Turtles, there's a lot of trend followers out there who have built careers, asset management careers, and also trading advisory, selling systems based around the idea of buying channel breakouts. And I'm just telling you that you can fade those channel breakouts. They're both true but they're true in different contexts. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, I'm very suspicious of moving averages in most contexts, but if we can find places where markets have made big moves from moving averages, and I certainly do not care what period moving average you're using, uh, you know, anywhere from 10, 50, 100, if you have some way to look at a large excursion, bands are useful, Keltner's, Bollinger's, um, it's just some large movement from an average price, there's a tendency for mean reversion. Do be aware that different asset classes have different tendencies for mean reversion. Stocks tend to mean revert more. Currencies mean revert less. Futures, somewhere in the middle. So it does definitely call into question, can we use any tool on any time frame in any market? <coughs> and I apologize, but I'm getting over a cold. I'm mostly recovered, but I still have a little bit of a, little bit of a cough, so I will probably cough in your ear a little bit more over the next half hour. Um, and we thought about doing this presentation. Tom and I were kind of kicking some ideas around, and he said, you know, one of the things you might want to talk about is what happens with stocks at 52-week highs when markets make new highs. This is something I've been focusing on a lot in my research, in the research that I write for clients and in some of the social media work, because I think this is very, very timely and important. So as I said, a lot of fundamental systems 
include some token technicals, and one of the most common is to buy stocks that are at 52-week highs. Uh, the idea is very, very logical that uh, if a stock is at a 52-week high, well, the market's already voted. So it's a good stock already. And this kind of plays into the relative strength idea too. Uh, however, this is wrong because buying stocks at 52-week highs puts you on the wrong side of the market. And this is the only table like this I have in this presentation, but if you like numbers, I have a lot of numbers in other places. Um, let me explain what you're looking at here. So think of this as um, the is three columns is the best way to think of it. So if you look at the first column, you're looking at stocks, futures in the middle, currencies on the right. And then the top of each, of, of each column is buy and the bottom is the sell signal. And then the individual lines, this is what happens. You can see the days over on the far left. This is what happens, one, two, three, five, 10, 15, and 20 days after a market makes a 260 day, which is roughly 52 week high. Uh, one thing that I have done here, and it doesn't matter much if you do that, but so, you, so you're in a situation where you're not shorting day after day, which isn't really realistic, right? Um, you know, imagine that a stock goes up 10 days in a row, makes a 52-week high. You probably don't want to short every one of those closes, right? So one way to – I've done the research like that also, but one way to make this a little bit more realistic is let's say we're going to wait at least five days between entries. So in that situation, we would short the first 52-week high, and then we would not do another short entry until we're five days out from that, wherever the market is, would be the first time we would have the potential to put on another short. So that's, again, the number is pretty much the same whether you do it. Um, within each box, so if we're looking in the upper left-hand corner, the equities by the uh, column, which you see the subscript, uh, the mean signal minus the baseline, which is B. So this is the excess return. And to look at all of these patterns, basically what you need to do is figure out the baseline return for the market, and that will be different in every sample you look at. If stocks, for instance, over a large sample tend to go up about 7% over the course of a year. So you have to back that return out. And that gives us the signal, uh, it gives us the, the excess return is kind of the bottom line. And so what you see is that stocks have a very consistent negative return after making 52-week highs. In this particular sample, 20 days out, we're 102 basis points under the baseline. So that's a percent. Now, is losing a percent over a, a month a bad thing? Not necessarily, but what you, you know, it's not the end of the world. But uh, what it does tell us is that if we rush to buy this breakout, on average, we're on the wrong side of the market. And I just, you know, I'm going to give you this presentation uh, afterwards. You can go through it. You can look at these numbers in a little bit more detail. But it is very interesting to notice that futures in the second box don't have the same tendency. So here, for a very simple pattern, you see that, uh, you know, if you were to buy every futures market when it made a 52-week high, you'd be up a month later an average of a percent versus down a percent in stocks. So, and that these are statistically significant numbers. Currencies don't really have a statistically significant edge. So this is an example of how we use statistics, how we use uh, quantitative tendencies to understand market behavior. And there still needs to be a little bit of discretion when is this relevant. And I think in this particular market environment, this is very relevant. We've worked to be, uh, we work very hard to have our clients long going into this move and to advise people, don't buy this breakout. Uh, in general, buying breakouts is very, very difficult. Perhaps we'll have a spot here over the next few weeks where we can look to buy again, and we'll just have to see how the market plays out. Trading momentum, hey Adam, this is the other, yes, yep. Uh, if you go back to the last slide, there are a couple of questions. What the uh, stars were, they have some with two stars, some with one, and then, uh, Let's see, what's the other one? Now, does Correct. futures mean equity index and not oil, gold, corn, et cetera? Okay, two very good questions. Um, yes, you know, so the problem with futures is when you say futures, you're really baking a lot of things into futures. 
You could you have your financial futures, uh, your stock indexes, rates, currencies, and then you have all of the um, you know as Gartman says the things that hurt your foot when you drop them on your foot, the physical things. In this particular case, um, they are mixed together. So this futures includes a mix of hard commodities and financial futures. Um, you certainly can separate it, split it out different ways, and you will see some different behavior. Um, equity index futures, not a big surprise, do behave more like equities than they do like, say, soybeans or wheat. Uh, as for the answer with the stars, one and two, those are measures of statistical significance. I'm not sure exactly what levels we used for this table. Um, the two stars might be the 99% and maybe one star is 95. Uh, the way this, this is a typical presentation for published research, for academic research, but, and it's not, you know, we can have a long discussion about the, the follies and the potential pitfalls with significance testing, but it is important to have some idea, you know, if you're telling me something is down 14 basis points, What's the likelihood of that simply being noise versus being an important signal? And it is the important thing here is to notice that the equities column uh, is clear and loud statistical significance. And the, the futures do achieve that a little bit further out, but maybe not in the near term. So uh, good questions. And as, as I Thanks. said, uh, if, if you like, the, and, and you know, I think you should, if you like and are interested in this type of presentation, uh, I do a lot of nerdy <laughs> number stuff like this. And the previous presentation I did for you folks has a, a lot more of this. And you also can find a lot of it on my blog, social media. So let's flip over and look at momentum, which is kind of the other way. Um, basically, with momentum, what we're looking for is some evidence that a move is likely to continue. And one of the most reliable things, and here's where people get in a lot of trouble, uh, one of the most reliable indicators is volatility compression. A lot of ways to measure that, but what I mean is if you have a market that becomes not in implied volatility, but in realized volatility, historical volatility, if you have a market that becomes very quiet relative to its own long-term volatility, and you see we could measure that with ratios of historical volatility, looking at, say, one week or maybe even like a three-day volatility relative to a one-month or six-month volatility. Looking at that ratio, when that ratio becomes very low, we can say in the short term the markets become very quiet. You could do things with measuring the range of bars, true range, a lot of different ways to measure it, but the concept is what's very important. When a market becomes very quiet, and then a market makes a sharp move, a breakout, that breakout is likely to have some continuation. And the problem is that a lot of people who are sizing positions based off of volatility, and that's, it's an intelligent way to set your stops. Um, you, know, you want wider stops, more volatile markets, tighter stops in quiet markets. You can get seduced when the market becomes quiet, use these very tight stops or to have an idea if a market's been dead for a while and then it explodes to the upside, you can say, well, it's probably a mistake. It's probably not a mistake. And I think a lot of trading mistakes are made there. So just realize that when a market becomes very compressed, chart patterns can help with this, by the way. This, a triangle on a chart is a classic expression of this volatility that breakouts from those areas are likely to have continuation. Momentum is likely to win for a while. Pullbacks, pullbacks and established trends. Uh, when I say established trends, we need to be careful because if I give you a chart and you go back and look, uh, your perception of what is an established trend is you've already seen the future. And this is why we need to figure out exactly how to frame these things and why just looking at patterns on charts might not be the best way to do statistical analysis for that unavoidable look-ahead bias. And I do suggest some ways to get around that. Uh, as I said, some traditional chart patterns can be useful for these. Um, going to skip over this and just kind of jump to the pattern thing. So I've spent hours and hours and hours talking about patterns, writing about patterns. And if you are interested in that, we'll give you this presentation. These links are live. 
Uh, so you can click on these, and these will take you to the archives on my blog. So I think four patterns every trader should be familiar with. The, pull the pullback, what I call the anti, and I got that word from Linda Raschke. That's not my terminology, but it's a great framework for a trade. Uh, failure test and trend termination or end of trend, if you will, patterns. Uh, you can use those hyperlinks, but it, you also don't need to. If you want to uh, look at what I write about this anti-pattern, just go to Google, type in anti-Adam Grimes, and that will pull up a lot of links to my blog that will give you days of reading on these patterns. And not only have I written about these conceptually, but if you go to my blog, I also over the years have pointed some of these out as they've happened in the market, So you ha in various markets. So you have a record of patterns and can see how they worked and how they didn't work. It's a, it's a pretty cool resource, so do check that out. And we won't spend a lot more time talking about patterns, but I will tell you in general, they're only useful if they pass the is it useful test. So I'm not interested in uh, some pattern if I can't prove there's a statistical edge following the pattern. Otherwise, why are we even talking about it? Uh, useful patterns do exist. I have not found them to work exactly as advertised. Uh, you know, again, remember everything happens within this realm of probability, and a lot of patterns do hover at the edge of statistical significance. It's not as simple as saying this is a yes, this is a, this is a no, and a lot of good patterns might be a three to four percent tilt over the baseline. In other words, if you look at a lot of stocks and you find on average they go up, uh, let's just say the next day they close positive 53% of the time, a really good pattern might show you they close up 57% of the time after the pattern. And that doesn't seem like a huge edge. It's not, it was, you know, certainly when I started this business, I thought there were patterns that would show me with some degree of certainty what happens in the future. And that just doesn't exist. That's not reality. It's not the way the market works. And you can see that extracting value from a 3% to 4% edge is not easy. It takes a large sample size. It takes discipline. It takes proper risk management. And also be aware that these averages hide big events in either direction. So it's perfectly possible that that you know, probability of a stock closing up the next day, go back to that pattern, it's a 3% edge. Well, you could very well buy a stock with that pattern on close today, and it opens down 20% tomorrow. That can happen. That certainly does happen. So just be aware. I, you know, going back to this idea of what happens with stocks at 52-week highs, on average, they decline. They decline 8% over a month. However, this could be the time that the market's up 10% a month later. It's certainly it's possible. This could also be the time, you know, knock on wood, uh, that this doesn't happen, but this could, we could be 50% lower two weeks from now with some unforeseen event. So crazy things can happen. The markets are both more boring and crazier than people realize, so just be aware of that. I also think, and this might challenge some of your thinking, uh, I don't think the details of patterns are important. And I say this, I have uh, boxes, you know, bankers boxes, uh, cardboard boxes full of papers where I've done all of this research looking at the nuances of patterns. And I used to think finding the best example of the pattern to trade was the, the way you made money trading. And I think this stuff works on more of a conceptual framework that in many cases kind of the right thing to do is to, you almost squint at the chart and say, could that be a pullback? Yeah, okay, so we don't need to argue the details of how the sides are sloping, where to put our stop, we know what to do and we have this pattern, we put the trade on, we put the stop here and we see how it works. Basically you step up to the table and you roll the dice, which is not how uh, you know, a lot of people like to think about trading, but. That's the reality, that's what we do. And I think if you don't somehow realign your thinking to reality, you're gonna be a difficult trading for you. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but in my previous presentation here, uh, I did spend quite a few words talking about with trend and counter trend trading. Just be aware that I have an upcoming podcast where I look at a lot of trading wisdom, you know, a lot, a lot of sayings that people use. Um, 
ride your winners, for instance. Uh, only price pays. And I talk about how while there's truth in these, there's also uh, a lot of there's a lot of things that are wrong. And you know, ride your winners is true for trend followers. It's very destructive advice for counter trend traders. So you have to be aware that your set, your unique set of trading wisdom for your style, for your personality, for your approach may be very different than what somebody else says and what somebody else uses and somebody else's wisdom may not apply to you. So just be aware of that. So I've talked here about with trend and counter trend and most of my work is based on directional trading. But what about non-directional, which I know many of you are asking. Uh, yes, certainly there's good money to be made non-directionally, but I would throw out, and one thing that I would like a lot of options traders to think about, you have to have an edge. You know, it's very clear as a directional trader, if you're going to buy a market, if you're going to short a market, I don't have to argue very long for you to see if you're going to buy that market, there needs to be some edge to that market going up in the future or you're wasting your time. That's pretty easy to understand. However, I think with options, this gets to be a little bit more complicated because these other ideas kind of get baked into it. You know, this idea that there is a, uh, for instance, you can make money selling options because they're overpriced. That's a thing that I would say is almost a marketing gimmick for that's that, that sold to the public. It's true in some ways, but I don't think it's as true as people would like it to be. Uh, I would encourage you to approach options with the idea that they're usually fairly priced. That if you put on a trade and you do enough trades, you're going to come out net zero before transaction costs, of course, uh, all the many transaction costs, that the trade you're pretty much going to average out to zero after a lot of trades. Now the question is, uh, what is a lot of trades? Well, you know, what, what, what is that large sample size? Um, the problem is that with options, that there are a lot of things that work, and then we have these 20-year events. And I personally have seen a number of options traders taken out of the business, uh, had their net worth destroyed by these one in, you know, one in a bazillion events. They do happen. And some of these were big traders. Some of these were six, seven-figure-a-year traders, um, maybe seven, eight-figure-a-year traders for many, many years who literally lost it all in one event. So, um, you know, th this is why you want to think about hedging those tails. You want to think about, uh, you know, na naked short premium, you know, for instance, can be very dangerous. It can be winter for five years, ten years. You can see people building programs, building teaching programs based on that. And it's just very hard to understand the potential of a 1987 type event, which certainly does happen and will happen again. Um, and when I say you have to have an edge, what does that edge look like? Well, it's an edge in what's going to happen in volatility, whether it's the direction of volatility or the rate of change of volatility. Something about how volatility is going to evolve in the future has to be different than the baseline random expectation of volatility. So it's something to think about. I know that kind of challenges some of the thinking, but like I said, that's why I'm here. So let's move on to another question. Um, well, I, you know, actually this is what we just talked about a lot, when to get into trade. Just be aware that you do have to have that edge, uh, understand the full range of outcomes and how they project over associated timeframes. Be very careful, for instance, using day trader type information to project long-term trends. That would be silly, right? But uh, it's equally silly when you see somebody who has a very long-term perspective on markets making day trades based on that long-term perspective. It just doesn't apply. So make sure your stuff fits the time frame. Uh, how much to buy or sell? Well, so uh, there are all these different plans. I'm going to skip through things because I do want to kind of get to the end. Uh, actually, what I want to show you is this. Uh, so this is a, tra I'm going to show you some different, some outcomes from trading systems. And this is a theoretical system that wins 50% of the time. You've seen, if you've seen my work, you've seen this before. Uh, the wins are always 1.2 times the size of the losses. And all we have done is generated a random series of trades from this system. So 
if we start with $100,000 risking $2,000 per trade, do 250 trades, we expect to end up with $150,000 at the end of the series. And you can, you know, again, you have the presentations, you can go back through this. But what does this look like in practice? This is a revelation for a lot of people. Yeah, it doesn't look like this. It might look like this. It might look like this. It might even look like this. So this is a little bit hard to stomach, right? Because I've shown you a system that has a positive statistical edge, a positive expected value, a positive expectancy. We did 250 trades. There were no mistakes made in these 250 trades. But look at these three different outcomes. This makes it very difficult to evaluate trading results, to evaluate, and I think a lot of people are doing the wrong thing in the market, making money, or, you know, even more, or even worse, doing the right thing and losing money and wondering, what am I doing wrong? Well, luck is a huge part of this. And here, what I've done in this chart is put 100 different runs of that system. And just look at the extreme variability. The blue arrow is pointing to $150,000, which is the expected value. But look how many end up above, how many end up below. And there are quite a few that are hovering around just barely making money and including the one example that lost money. And, of course, you know, this is just – I'm playing with random numbers here, but the point is even if you have a statistical edge, even if you have a good system, even if you make no mistakes, there still is an unavoidable element of luck in your results. And your defense against that is correct position sizing. And this goes back to that discussion of the one in 20-year event. Uh, you know, it, it's very, might be very tempting to just go and sell a lot of premium, but thinking about what could potentially happen in those tails, uh, you know, that, that's, it's hard to understand your risk in something like that. So uh, it's also very hard to understand your trading results because, remember, we have poor intuition about randomness. So I'm um, going to just, again, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, and by the way, I'm open to questions here at the end, but also this is not the end necessarily. So if you look at this presentation, you have other questions, shoot me an email, go to my blog. Uh, you can find contact information there. I'll give you contact information here. And we certainly can keep an ongoing discussion. Many of the questions people ask end up becoming good uh, seeds for future presentations or for blog posts. So if you have ideas or questions here, you know, I'm certainly happy to keep the discussion going. But let's think about where to go from here. So even if you were able to perfectly assimilate all these rules and know what to do, actually doing it is very difficult. And one of the things that really changed my perspective on the market, I guess, is really during the financial crisis, 2007, uh, I realized that it's not that people aren't doing stupid things in the market because people are stupid. People are doing stupid things in the market because the market has evolved. The marketplace has actually evolved to encourage the wrong emotions, the wrong behavior at the wrong time. And here's a quote from my book. It's not so much the market is against us. It's that the market sets us against ourselves. It's that the market, when we talk about the market, what the market is is the sum, the end result of a lot of emotion, a lot of behavior from traders. There is no market out there. It's the reflection of ourselves. And that, that is very, very difficult. Most people are also not prepared for something like what I showed you a few slides back, people are not prepared for this. People think my trading results are going to look like this. If I'm an optimist like this, but they don't realize that this is also very possible, even making no mistakes. So um, that, that, that's a message that's a little sobering, but it's very, very important. It also will give you uh, – a little bit of fortitude in the winning streaks and to, to think, you know, like I just realized when I'm having winning trade after winning trade, I'm not this good. And also on the other side, when it seems like I can't find a winning trade, I'm also not this bad. You're never as good as you think you are at your best points. 
You're never as bad as you feel like you are. Your bad point, the average, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, I want to point you toward a few resources that I have. And let me give you uh, – actually, th this, is, th th this is a good last thought before I do that. Uh, trading is not an intellectual exercise. And I know in particular a lot of options traders tend to be cerebral, tend to be very well educated in other disciplines. A lot of people come from, say, engineering backgrounds. And we think that we can figure this out. We think that we're smart enough to figure it out. Uh, I do think even in highly quantitative trading disciplines, what you need to know can pretty much fit on a single piece of paper. It's not really about, and I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you where you can go learn a lot more. I'm going to encourage you to learn a lot more and to dig a lot deeper. But it's not really about what you know. You have to go through that process. You have to learn everything you can. It's very, very important. I have a huge lever in education. But at the end of the day, what you need to know is actually a fairly small information set. The main challenges are finding an edge and then even bigger, managing your own behavior, implementing that edge. And just... I think a lot of people lose at the trading game because they misunderstand the nature of the game. It's not intellectual. So some resources. Uh, I do have a blog. You can just Google my name. Uh, there's an actor out there who also has my name, but it's pretty clear who is who. If you, uh, you know, click on some of the links, you'll see. But uh, if you use adamhgrimes.com, that will take you to my blog where I have written and continue to write quite a bit at times. I also have a podcast which has been dormant for a while. I'm resurrecting that very soon. I uh, talk about a lot of different topics related to training and uh, human performance. I also want to point you toward a free trading course that I have. And whether you have this link or not, you can find it from my blog. You can also just Google free trading course. Um, Adam Grimes trading course will pull this up. This is absolutely free. There's no premium area. There's no upsell. There's no members area. Um, it's 30 plus hours of video with thousands of charts, uh, hundreds of exercises for you to do. Not just me, but some other uh, you know, pretty big names in the business have contributed some modules. So uh, we'll take you from, it's designed to take you from knowing nothing to being a competent trader, and it's out there for free. Also, uh, you know, I talked about meditation, and we don't really have much time to dig into this deeper, but uh, on my blog, I have a 22-day, I believe it is, meditation course, and this is designed to be done in 5 to 15 minutes a day. Very simple. You sit down, you listen to a one to two minute lesson, and then you do a little bit of meditation it's designed to put you in touch with a lot of different practices and styles of meditation. And at the end of this, you'll have the experience to dig a little bit deeper and develop your own practice. Also, I want to point you toward Waverly Advisors Research. And uh, I do have, if you go to my blog, uh, there's a recent post, Where Are Markets Going Next, which will let you download the report that I wrote this weekend. I write a um, large report over the weekend and then a shorter daily update with a webinar in the middle of the week. And you know, I was telling Tom before the presentation, I'm really bad at self-promotion in so many ways. But one of the things that's been very, very rewarding for me is hearing from my clients things like, um, I had a guy tell me, thank you for encouraging me to buy your work. It's the best money I ever spent for trading you. Know, things like that. Uh, people say this has made a bigger difference in my profitability than anything has in decades of trading. I um, just got an email from a guy a few weeks ago. I've had my most profitable three weeks you know, ever. So seeing stuff like that, knowing that I've been a part of that is really, uh, really rewarding. So check it out. See if it's something. It's certainly not for everybody, but see if it's something that might help you. Uh, and if you think it is, we offer a several week, no obligation, no pressure trial. And I will mention that we do a discount for Capital Discussions members. So just at some point during the trial, uh, if you go to the end, you and I will speak on the phones. So you, you can mention it there. Mention Tom or Capital Discussions, and we do a bit of a discount there for that. So uh, that is pretty much what I have for us today. Uh, Tom, right. do we have some questions? Yeah, hey, we did have a couple. You can probably switch to the chat if you want to pull them up, but um, Rick Van Buren was asking, do you have any definitions or descriptions of the items you cover in your newsletters? 
I think he subscribed uh, as well. Okay. Uh, so by items, do you mean, or uh, I guess are you talking about patterns or indicators? Um, Rick, I think send me an email and let, let me understand this question a little bit better. Uh, okay, for indicators, if you go to, go to my firm's website, waverlyadvisors.com, and there are some links up at the top. There is a Using Our Research, which digs into the indicators in a little bit more depth. I have a similar page on my blog. Uh, I don't use a lot of indicators. I use Keltner channels. I use MACD. I uh, talk a little bit about something I call Sigma Spikes, which is just um, looking at a volatility-adjusted move. The calculations are there. A uh, few paragraphs on the indicators are there. That might be everything you need. If you need more information, send me an email, and I'll make sure you get what you need. Uh, see, uh, I see. Okay, so I can see the questions here because I switched over. Uh, so Bryce asks, which one of my book would I recommend for a beginner? Uh, for a beginner, so I, I, I have two books out, and I'm working on a third. Uh, there is a very short book, which you actually can read for free on the Kindle, that is uh, kind of an introduction to quantitative analysis. And this is a very ba – it's a premise, it's a very basic introduction to statistics. I think if you're a complete beginner, what I would have you do is work through my trading course. And you can do that with uh, – you, you, you can do that with the help of my book. The trading course will point out uh, specific sections of the book that you should read. But the trading course is in no way uh, <laughs> designed to sell books. So, in other words, you can do the trading course without the book. I think go to the trading course and do the homework there. Read the book if you wish. Uh, read the relevant topics on my blog. I think that's probably how I would have a beginner start. Um, let me see. I think the next More one is about the 260-day channel for Mohit. Yes, so Mohit um, – to understand that slide a little bit better, Tom, is there an easy way for them to find the first presentation I did for you? Uh, I, I posted a link to it in the chat. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, make sure that you – if you go to that presentation, I do go into that in a lot more depth, into how to read the table. Um, the, I, I basically just glossed over. I could spend hours talking about the methodology and the approach. If you, if you don't understand that, it's a little bit hard to understand the slide. And I apologize for just kind of throwing a dense slide in there without the background. Uh, look at that. And then, Mohit, if you still have questions, um, let me, you know, send me an email. And maybe that would maybe be a good thing for a blog post or something. I will certainly will address it. Uh, I have a question to um, post the link to the meditation resource, which is here. Thank you. Andrew posted that, so thank you for doing that. I guess a few more words about meditation, if, if you can give me a couple minutes. It's, it's one of those things that it's kind of in vogue right now. You know, everybody's saying, I'm going to meditate to get this result. And it, it, it's something, you know, I'm, I get a little skeptical when things kind of become part of the pop psychology. But I will tell you that nothing has done as much for my focus for my ability to see the market, for my ability to understand statistics, for my ability to manage the emotions of trading, is implementing a disciplined meditation practice. It is something that takes some time. Eventually, you're going to need to work up to probably spending half an hour a day doing it. Um, I'm very pleased with the meditation experience. I'm not really calling it a course that I put out there. So check that out. I think that will... Um, I think that will help you get started in the right direction with that. Um, and then I'm looking up. I think we covered all the rest of them, Adam. I think we got it. I think we got it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, hey. And for uh, the really good, yeah, really really good presentation. Really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Uh, for my email address, you can use uh, Adam at AdamHGrimes.com. You also can go to my blog, and there's a contact uh, link there. And I'm I'm very findable on Google. So you know if you if you're wondering what I've written about something, just Google my name and then the something, and you also can find a lot of links to contact me there. Twitter's also good at Adam H Grimes is a good way to contact me also. 
And I know, uh, Adam, you're not good at self-promotion, but I've been subscribing to your newsletter now for about five months, and I, I have to say it's uh, highly recommended, and I would encourage everybody who's listening to at least do a trial and check it out because I think you'll find it very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly appreciate that. And, Adam, we look forward to having you back again. Uh, great presentation as always. So uh, thanks so much for everyone also who stayed with us to the end. So it's uh, always a good sign when people stay all the way to the end. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. And I look forward to next time. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll see you next time. Bye.